The NFL starts on Thursday. We'll take a look at some of the big changes coming this season and how New Orleans is working to make the Super Bowl more accessible. Plus, a few college football programs are already at a crossroads early in the season. Scotty Scheffler added to his incredibly successful and lucrative year, and we'll hear from a former MLS and Premier League player whose business is leaning into women's soccer. It's Tuesday, September 3rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, we have a great conversation with disability advocate Mark Raymond Jr. on how he's working with New Orleans to make sure everyone can enjoy Super Bowl 59. We're also hearing from former soccer player Eddie Lewis on his business, Toka, and why he's leaning more into the women's game. We'll check in on the biggest stories in college football and preview this NFL season. First, hear your top headlines. ESPN and ABC went dark on Sunday for DirecTV customers due to a carriage dispute between Disney and the cable provider. That cuts off access to the US Open to 11 million people. Both sides will be heavily motivated to strike a deal by Monday when ESPN broadcasts the season's first Monday night football game between the Jets and 49ers. Disney got into a similar dispute with Charter last year. As cable subscribers drop, cable providers don't want to pay the same prices to networks, even for premium channels. Cable subscribers dropped by 8.8% from the start of 2023 to the start of this year to 54 million, according to research and markets. UEFA has implemented price caps on away fans' tickets for the Champions League, Europa, and Conference Leagues beginning next season. Last season, some events saw visitor seats priced nearly 10 times the price of those for home fans. For the upcoming year, tickets will be capped at 60 euros in the Champions League, 40 for the Europa League, and 20 for the Conference League, before those numbers go even lower in the following season. UEFA president Alexander Cheferin called the move a key step in reaffirming UEFA's commitment to enhancing the matchday experience for all fans. Oklahoma State's creative NIL fundraising campaign is dead before it begins. Last week, the team announced QR codes on players' helmets that would open to a direct contribution page for the Cowboys' NIL collective. The codes were supposed to debut in Saturday's season opener until the NCAA announced they were blocking the new initiative as advertising and commercial marks which are not permitted on players' uniforms. OK State told CNN that although they disagreed with the NCAA's decision, the school would, quote, abide by it and work with the appropriate groups to lead on the needed change. Yesterday saw one of the greatest rivalries of this century renewed for the first time in almost 15 years. Competitive eaters Takeru Kobayashi and Joey Chestnut squared off in a hot dog eating contest on Monday night, live on Netflix, alongside other pro eaters Matt Stoney and Leah Schuttkever. The event was highly anticipated after Nathan's banned Joey Chestnut from the July 4th hot dog eating contest for signing a deal with vegan brand Impossible Foods that is believed to be more valuable than the $1.2 million he left on the table from Nathan's. 49ers rookie receiver Ricky Pearsall is out of the hospital after being shot in the chest on Friday in an attempted robbery. Initially listed in serious but stable condition, Pearsall is now in fair condition and was released from San Francisco General Hospital on Sunday. According to his mother's Facebook, the bullet passed through his chest and out his back, but did not strike any vital organs. It's unclear when Pearsall will return to the football field. FOS Today also sends condolences to the families of Johnny and Matthew Goudreau, who were killed Friday morning by a drunk driver. Getting behind the wheel in that state is never, ever worth it. Please be smart and think of others before you do. The NFL begins this week with the reigning Super Bowl champion Chiefs hosting the Baltimore Ravens in a rematch of the 2024 AFC Championship. This season will be an important one as new changes are rolled out both on the field and in the business landscape of the league. Gameplay will look different this season as the NFL rolls out new rules, including a modified kickoff system, which I'm excited for, increased use of replay systems, and new safety rules to promote player health. This could also be the last time that we see the famous chain gang as the league moves towards an optical tracking system to measure first downs. Off the field, changes are coming as well. NFL owners voted last week to allow for private equity investment in teams up to 10% of total ownership, and deals with firms are expected before too long. The opening act, Chiefs and Ravens, are the 24th and 22nd most valuable teams in the NFL respectively, yet both of them are still worth at least $4.85 billion, according to Forbes, a billion more than the average valuation of an NBA franchise, and over $2 billion more than the average MLB team. The top-grossing single-country sports league in the world, with over $18 billion in annual revenue, returns for its 59th season of the Super Bowl era at 8.20 p.m. Eastern on Thursday. Many NFL stadiums are rolling out improvements this season, like new scoreboards and better Wi-Fi, but some are implementing less flashy but more impactful changes. I spoke to disability advocate Mark Raymond Jr. on the work he's doing with New Orleans to improve access to the Super Bowl. We also discussed the state of access in stadiums and arenas right now.
I'm joined now by disability advocate Mark Raymond Jr. Welcome, Mark. Hi, nice to be here. Yeah, great to have you on. Um, so let's let's start getting to know you a little bit. Uh, you had a spinal cord injury. Uh, how old were you when that happened? 27 years old. It was July 4th, 2016. Dove off the back of a buddy's boat. And uh, yeah, it, woke up in the hospital a few weeks later to learn that I damaged my spinal cord and life was going to be a little different. Um, I am paralyzed from about the chest down. I'm a full-time power wheelchair user, so I have some arm function, a uh, little hand function, mostly just like my, my wrist extensors, um, but it has been a journey uh, through life, navigating this adversity and getting to really live this perspective, and honestly, it's uh, it's just as fulfilling as any other life. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that, and if you could talk a little bit about how it's changed your perspective. I'm sure there's, you know, sort of the more obvious ways that one might think of, but, uh, you know, for people, you know, who, who, you know, are, haven't had to deal with that. What was sort of the most, um, you know, notable or surprising or the, in terms of your perspective change, how quickly you start looking for curb, curb cuts at the end of every corner, right? Like I, I, I'm looking at, I'm looking to the end of the block on every block that I roll on. So that level of intentionality, repetitively, the consistency, the the discipline, you know, because it's frustrating as hell if you get halfway down the block and like a chunk of concrete's missing out of the sidewalk and you can't. So now you got to go all the way back around. Nobody wants to do that, you know, and um, all kinds of things too, like just the lack of, I think, resources in community for people who are aging and live with disabilities, like that's a big challenge. Uh, and that's some work that we also address through the nonprofit that I run, Split Second Foundation. So we provide a real holistic care experience for the aging and disabled community by offering fitness, mental health, resource navigation, nutrition programming, like all in one space that you know, they can really thrive in. Yeah, right. I mean, I think when people think disability access, they think things like wheelchair ramps, but I'm sure it's Obviously, when you get into the the whole life, it's it's a whole life. It's a holistic yeah. thing. There's holistic challenges. Um, so yeah, and and we can get into the the sports end of that. You're working with New Orleans to improve disability access to Super Bowl Fifty Nine. What are the the big steps that you're taking that they're taking that you know have to happen to make this something that everyone can enjoy? So New Orleans and company took a really intentional approach on how we're marketing to disabled tourists um, by doing a series of videos that I did with them to basically explain like, you know, how to get around, where to go, some things to think about, where could you stay? Uh, here's some good restaurants, right? Like really just trying to sh show them like the potential. It's not super hard, but we do need you to have a plan. And here's what having that plan looks like. Um, from that came a lot of other conversations too, about like, how are we being intentional about, you know, communicating that same type of message, um, with venues like the Superdome and, um, especially with the Super Bowl coming up, the city's making a ton of infrastructure improvements. So I just wanted to always advocate that now, like, while you're making these improvements, let's keep this at top of mind too. So if there's you know, better technology out there now, maybe for a curb cut and, you know, you're walking across the street, whereas verbal cues. So you cover every disability, you know, cognitive, sensory and um, physical in your improvement project. It does make me wonder, you know, if I'm, you know, going to just like a game with, you know, whether it's baseball game, basketball game, you know, with with someone who has difficulty walking or, you know, uh, other challenges do you think in this day and age we can expect that there will be the proper accommodations in place, at least at, you know, major league or, you know, major, yeah, like NBA facilities, NHL, um, or is it still kind of case by case? No, my experience is every stadium's kind of the same and like having ADA assistance uh, available to kind of escort you to your seats and kind of get you sorted. One of the challenges that I think they'll need to correct uh, is like 
the, the how they sell those tickets that's a kind of a challenge sometimes you might have to buy like just a regular ticket and see if they have seats available for you at the games um that's one of the challenging spots but from a like actual physical accessibility perspective it's it's not terrible they, uh, they mostly do a good job now and, and yeah you know, are there some sports or even types of venues that are, have been ahead of the curve here newer ones for sure like living in new orleans honestly the superdome just got a ton of renovations and some of that was stemmed from an ada lawsuit but it was built in the 70s right so like what's you know what's the benchmark here what's the bar that was it predated the ada now they've made a ton of ada and related improvements you know i think when you know people who are aren't in this world think about it we mostly think about just your basic mobility stuff ramps yeah. elevators that kind of thing are there sorts of accommodations that you know people don't always think about you know beyond beyond those you know sort of easier to see ones i think it's that one is mostly the answer is yes and it's customer service it's making sure that everybody at every in every department on your staff understands disability to some extent. So you're not you take the bias away from people, basically. And I think a lot of there needs to be a lot of customer service and bias related training on how people are communicating to other people, uh, especially people that are differently abled, because a lot of times like you know, in, in society, you feel the the stares and the, it just, there's a level of uncomfortable. Um, some folks are uncomfortable from that. I don't really care. But, um, you know, it's just, I think that uh, the, the bias training would really help a lot of these venues, uh, just in terms of like overall experience and customer service. And yeah, when you, when you mentioned bias is that, you know, like, People see you're in a wheelchair, and so they maybe they make some assumption about like your mental capabilities. Is it that kind of thing, or you know, it, if you could actually, I'm, I'm curious what kind of stuff you encounter. It's like not really the mental thing as much as like people just want to come up and be like, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh my God, I'm praying for you." It, like strangers, you know, it's, it's like, "Hi, I'm Mark. It's nice to meet you." You know, like don't be weird. You just you don't I think a lot of times speaking to the bias, the assumption that able bodied people have is that being disabled is a miserable experience. Like and I'm miserable. I'm not. Uh, I live a great life, you know. You just keep kind of rolling with the punches and y'all are being weird. <laughs> Honestly, that's sort of the um, something that people can overthink and um kind of get in their heads on it, which is like, I want to accommodate you, help you in the ways you need help, but also like not make a big deal out of it. Um, I wonder if you have any just like ways of like thinking about it or recommendations for people who are are trying to like, you know, have good intentions, but um, are, are get into this awkward zone of like, what do I do here? Just ask, uh, but ask from the lens of like empathy, not like a joke, right? I think, um, you know, especially if it's a stranger, Right, or you see something that somebody might look like they need some help. Uh, I think it's always safe to just ask. Hey, buddy, you need a hand? Paralympic Games are happening right now. Is this yes. a moment that helps increase awareness around disability access in sports? Absolutely. I think um, every opportunity that you see programming specific to that community, it makes it more mainstream. Uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that I feel a lot of people lose sight of is like going through life. None of us are going to make it off this rock, you know, alive. Like we're going to cycle over into something else. Um, the, the goal is to like, and going through that, I'm sorry, you're going to experience disability in different ways. That's just a part mm -hmm. of aging. Um, so a lot of our trainings now are related to that as well. That helps. We we need we need more Paralympic Games. Uh, Prince Harry actually has his own. The Invictus Games? Invictus, yes. So a lot of countries do it. I mean, it's just... Uh, New Orleans actually just hosted the Paralyzed Veterans of America's Wheelchair Games. That was July 25th to July 30th. So it was a huge test for the city to see how we can handle 
six hundred wheelchair users, and it 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 seems uh seems to have gone pretty good. And before we let you go, if there's you know, if you could improve one you know one thing in the the sports world when it comes to disability access and participation, what would you like to see? Who more floor seats? Floor seats are hard to come by, so if we can uh if we can send this this clip to the NBA. I would greatly appreciate it if y'all would open up access on the floor at NBA games. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, Mark Raymond, really appreciate you having you on. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. I appreciate being here. The introduction of the NIL era has brought a whirlwind of change, and one of the biggest differences has been the revamped transfer portal. One of its most notable opponents has been Clemson head coach Dabo Swinney, who refuses to use the portal for his ACC program. Saturday, the results were on display with a 34-3 loss against the number one Georgia Bulldogs. Clemson, once a powerhouse program in college football, has fallen off the map by its standards. The Tigers haven't made the college football playoffs since losing the national championship game to LSU in 2020. Many have pointed to Swinney's refusal to recruit from the transfer portal, which has been in place since 2018, as the reason behind the school's fall from grace. In fact, Clemson was the only FBS program in the entire country not to have a single incoming transfer in 2024. In a press conference after the loss to Georgia, Swinney responded to questions about his lack of attention to the portal, saying, People are going to say whatever they want to say, and when you lose like this, people have got every right to say whatever they want to say. With the Tigers looking to leave the ACC for the Big Ten, Swinney might have to get with the times sooner rather than later. Former Boston Celtic Glenn Davis, a.k.a. Big Baby, was sentenced to three years and four months in prison for his involvement in a scheme to defraud the NBA's health and welfare plan out of more than $5 million. However, he is being allowed to delay his sentence to finish a documentary on his life, funded by his former teammate Kevin Garnett. The two won a championship together in 2008. Part of the rationale for granting the delay is that Davis will earn money from the film, which will help him pay $80,000 in restitution to one of the victims. He earned $34.4 million in salary over eight NBA seasons, but that money is all gone, according to his lawyer, who said that at one point, Davis asked her for $800 to keep his phone working. Judge Valerie Caproni wrote that she hopes optimism about the financial rewards of the film is warranted while granting the delay in his sentence. Davis and over 20 other players and doctors were convicted of a scheme that used fake invoices for made-up dental work to take millions from the NBA's health program. He is now set to begin his sentence on October 22nd. The villain of the summer strikes again. The Seine River is now causing the same problems for the Paralympics that it did for the Olympic Games a month ago, namely the postponement of the triathlon events that take place in the water. Like clockwork, heavy rains once again contributed to rising bacteria and pollution levels in the river over the weekend, and testing revealed it was unsafe for the athletes to enter for Sunday morning's paratriathlon, which had already been proactively delayed due to the rain forecast. Parisian officials spent over $1.5 billion to expedite the Seine's cleanup process leading up to the Olympics, the final push of a multi-decade project. To go from illegal to swim in to safe and comfortable to host dedicated water events was always going to be an ambitious commitment, but despite multiple postponements and stories of athletes getting sick from the water during the games, the French said they largely accomplished their goal. Now we are seeing the same issue from July rear its head during the Paralympics. As officials continue to work towards opening up the river to the public for the first time in a century, erratic rain patterns and their effect on pollution seem to be the biggest obstacles in the way. Eddie Lewis played in MLS, the Premier League, and the U.S. men's national team. When he retired as a player, he had some ideas about how he might stay involved in the soccer world, which had to do with a training technique he stumbled on that he initially thought was too weird to do in front of other players. Now he has an entire business based on that idea. As that grows, he's leaning more into women's soccer. We talked about all of that and the new era coming for the men's national program, and that conversation is next. Joined now by Eddie Lewis, founder of Toka and former MLS and Premier League player who also played in the World Cup. Welcome, Eddie. Hey, Owen. Good to uh, to be here. Good to see you again. Yeah, great to have you back on. You know, it's no secret that soccer is on the rise in this country. You know, we see that through uh, the you know, viewership numbers and NLS and M MLS and NWSL, uh, the, you know, the, the media deals they're getting, the, the team valuations. Um, have you seen that same kind of rise, you know, on the training side of it or, or, you know, more people getting interested in what you're offering? Yeah, I think, you know, both 
um, domestically and even now, you know, kind of for the first time internationally. I think, you know, you see across not just soccer, but all sports. In fact, you know, in almost any discipline, you know, there's always some sort of offering now for, you know, individual or extra training. And I think what's so unique about soccer is the fact that, you know, the skill set required, you know, because you can't use your hands, um, you know, everything is more or less learned, right? It's not necessarily natural. And, you know, while athletic ability is, is great, you know, the technical ability is, is critical. And, you know, I think we found a, um, a real hack in terms of the ability to develop those technical skills much, much quicker in a real, um, you know, kind of true match simulation format, which has translated really well to, you know, all of our players that are currently doing Tooker training and, and that's being reflected in the, in the growth of the company without a doubt. And you're also leaning into the growth on the women's side, especially you just brought in Alyssa and Giselle Thompson as stakeholders, Abby Wambach's on your board. You also work with Leah Williamson. Um, what kind of opportunity do you see just in the general growth of the women's game? Well, wow. I mean, yeah, for me, the, the women's game, um, the, the, the sky is the limit really. I mean, I think if you're in America, you know, you, you, you've just kind of always known it or assumed it right in our centers, half of our customers are girls. And that makes sense because there's as many girls playing soccer as there are boys, you know, without a doubt, I think as you know, you now look globally, there's been a huge push to, to continue to develop the, the women's game outside of the U S I think you're seeing incredible progress um, in some of these countries and in a very, very short period of time, as a result of that, they're really taking their existing, you know, kind of platform or leagues that have, have already existed. And now, you know, really starting to integrate women's teams into those. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just really excited about uh, the overall kind of global competition that is, is being brought to the sport. The level keeps getting better and better all the time. Um, you know, I think even in the U S they keep pushing the standards higher and higher. I don't know how much you saw of the, uh, of the Olympic team this summer, but such a fun team to watch, you know, not only the results, um, but the way they played and the just dynamic nature of the attack was, um, really, really enjoyable. And I think, you know, we, we, we trained with a lot of those girls in, in different capacities. So, um, you know, we, we, we feel like we took our, our own bit of credit in that, in that, uh, gold medal as well. Yeah. The, the front three of the women's team is just, yeah, super strong and fast and exciting. Um, we recently saw the record broken for the Seattle women's team with Angel City. Uh, we have, you know, some other, you know, big investments coming in that space. Do you think the level of investment in U.S. women's soccer is where it needs to be right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, as you said, some of these headlines and some of the numbers that are being thrown around, um, you know, certainly, certainly justify that. You know, I think there's still, you know, work and time. Um, really in terms of, you know, continuing to, to grow the fandom, you know, continuing to kind of advance the sport. But I think without a doubt, the number of, um, well, first of the, the, the values that have been associated with some of these teams, um, some of the owners and, and kind of leading women that have come into the sport and are really continuing to push the brands higher and higher are, are you know, without question. Um, and I think, again, we, we share in that, right, you know, on our board, um, it's Julie Haddon, you know, we have Abby Wambach, um, Celeste Burgoyne from Lululemon. I mean, these are all really powerful and influential women, um, not just in, in soccer, but in global brands in nature. And, you know, for me, I think it, it says a lot about what we're doing at Toka, but also, you know, the influence we can have on the sport, particularly with the women. Yeah. And when it comes to the growth of, of women's soccer, do you feel like we basically just need to keep doing everything that's going on right now and you know this it's already growing pretty quickly or are there other you know steps you'd like to see other other aspects come into play here yeah i mean i think i i definitely think there's there's more to be done you know i think the us has always had kind of a a benefit of you know they just have a, a larger population um and more of them are playing so naturally you know the us players are always going to um end up at the uh, at the top of the pyramid, so to speak, I think that's beginning to to change, and that's being challenged in many ways. Which I think number one is um, is good for the sport, but you know also I think it's 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 good for women's soccer 
in general, because, you know, for me, um, I think there's more opportunities for girls to have access to different types of games um, or trainings or opportunities that aren't just, you know, a standard club practice that are sort of three days a week. You know, I think you see more of those offerings that exist, you know, on the men's side. And, you know, as that starts to um, sort of balance out across the women's game, I just think it's going to translate into, you know, a better product on the field, which will then drive, you know, better fandom and, you know, ultimately, you know, better value for these clubs as well. Toka, of course, is, you know, it's for the, the serious soccer player, you know, someone who's on a competitive team or, you know, who wants to improve their game substantially. Uh, you also have Toka Social, which I think of as like top golf, but for soccer. And to me, I've been to a top golf once. The, the great appeal of it is that you can be miserable at golf and still, you know, whack a ball and, you know, see something fun happen on a screen. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if, if that's a, an accurate comparison and sort of the opportunities you see around just letting the casual soccer fan, you know, have some fun possibly with a drink either in their hand or nearby. Yeah. I mean, listen, that's exactly right. I think maybe on the first point, I'd, I'd challenge you a little bit with Toka soccer. We actually find that a lot of our guests um, are still, you know, kind of new to the sport or not necessarily, um, you know, experts or really high level players we can have a, a really great impact on players that are um you know in some cases just trying to um have a starting position on their club team or move from a uh, a lower level club team up to a higher level club team or make their varsity team from from the jv so i think we do kind of meet you where you're at very very well and and then move you up the ranks kind of relative to, to where you are but you know when you talk about toka social um Top golf is definitely the reference that that comes across most often. You know, I think in soccer, you know, there's a lot of work for, you know, relatively small amount of touches on the ball in the game. And I think we've managed to kind of bring all the best aspects in terms of, you know, controlling the ball or a first time finish or hitting a volley, you know, all the things that associated with that, that people love about the game um, and distilled it down into this um really great environment one in which you can easily be in um jeans and a pair of tennis shoes you know we're not looking for anybody to to sweat in a toko social setup but the idea of being able to hang out with your friends um and hit some volleys while you're having a drink and some great food uh, and enjoying time together is something that you know i think our guests really really enjoy what are your expectations for the u.s men's team you know heading toward the 2026 world cup in the mauricio pochettino era yeah, I mean, listen, I'm um, I'm definitely a, a kind of a glass half full guy. I think any time the World Cup is in your, you know, you're the host nation and, and it's it's in your country, you're going to get a huge lift from that. You know, I think we have this this really great crop of of you know what what used to be young players are now um, not necessarily young anymore. Um, that I think have you know in the last year or two maybe not um all achieved you know their full potential but really in these next couple of years could put themselves in a position to um you know have a really strong showing in the world cup you know I, i'm i'm still a part of the group that um has gone the furthest which was the quarterfinals and i would like nothing more than that record to be broken um and i think this is the the world cup to do it having pochettino you know in charge obviously lends you know a ton of um, kind of credibility and experience from a um, from an international standpoint, and I think the players will also, you know, respond to that. Right, um, this super high level coach with really high expectations, and I think those players are going to want to um, prove that they belong and that they, you know, deserve to be in that top caliber of 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 countries. And you know, I'm just hoping they can they can come together over these next couple of years to accomplish that. All right. Really enjoyed the chat. Eddie Lewis, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Okay. Cheers, Owen. Scotty Scheffler added $25 million to his 2024 PGA Tour winnings on Sunday with a victory in the FedEx Cup. With the addition of the largest purse in the sport's history, Scheffler has now earned $62 million in 2024 from tournaments alone. To get there, he's notched seven different wins while maintaining his number one spot in the pro rankings for the past 364 consecutive days. Scheffler has been a pro since 2018 and won his first tournament in February of 2022. 
He has earned $120.6 million on the course over his 13 career wins, but more than half of that money has come during this calendar year. He adds that to a package of endorsement deals valued at about $20 million. Not bad for a guy who was in jail earlier this year. Florida's 41-17 loss to Miami on Saturday was their sixth straight, dating back to a cold streak to end last year. That has led many to want a change at the top, but that move would be an expensive one. Head coach Billy Napier has a buyout clause in his contract that would cost the Gators $26.7 million if they let him go this year. That is equivalent to 85% of the remaining years on his $51.8 million deal, which runs through 2028. Florida has not had a winning season under Napier, who is in his third year at the helm. Napier may have a lifeline from a recent shakeup at the university's leadership. Ben Sass, a former senator, resigned as president over the summer, citing challenges related to his wife's epilepsy. He was replaced in the interim by his predecessor, Ken Fuchs, who hired Napier at the end of 2021. Napier can hope that Fuchs will have some attachment to his pick, especially when factoring in the cost of letting him go. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, drop us a review and throw us a like and subscribe on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.